So we've talked about countable sets and seen that the finite binary strings, for example, are countable, and then it turns out that the rational numbers are countable, and lots of other examples of countable sets that will come up in the homework and, and in class. But now I want to talk about uncountable sets. And it begins with a German mathematician named Cantor, who was asking the question whether all sets are the same size. And he gave a definitive answer, no, they're not. Cantor's theorem, which we will be developing now, shows how to keep finding bigger and bigger infinities. You give me a set, no matter how big it is, I can very quickly tell you and describe a set that's bigger. Well, we need to understand exactly what bigger means. Um, and we'll be using the ideas behind the Bige and Surge relations among sets. But before we do that, let's just look at the countable sets. So we saw that the definition of a countable set means you can list it. If A is countable, then you can write a list consisting of A0, A1, A2. Somehow or other, you can assign numbers to the elements of A in such a way that every element in capital A shows up in this list of little a's at some finite point. There's a little ambiguity about whether you want to allow the same element to occur more than once, but if you think about it, it doesn't really matter. Um, you could just filter the list uh, for duplicates so that if, even if you had a list with duplicates, you could get rid of them and then you have a list in which everything occurred exactly once. Um, so actually that means technically the way we can define countable is that countable says there's a mapping from those numbers, 0, 1, 2, and so on, um, to A that's a surjection, or maybe it's a bijection. It's a surjection if repeats are allowed, and it's a bijection if repeats are not allowed. And those are both equivalent definitions of what it means to be countable. It's countable if there is a surjection from the non-negative integers to A, or a bijection from the non-negative integers to A, and there's one if and only if there's the other. Um, another example of a finite of a countable set of the finite binary strings, which I mentioned earlier. So this is the notation we use. The set of uh, the set consisting of these two characters. We're thinking of zeros and ones now, as though they were characters in strings. And the star means finite strings of them. So these are the finite bit strings. Um, why are they countable? Well, you know, it's easy to see. You list all the finite bit strings of length 0 first. Well, there's only one, the empty string. Then list all the finite bit strings of length 1. Well, there are two, though, two of those, 0 and 1. Then list all the finite bit strings of two bits. There are four of those, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1, and so on. So you list all the finite binary strings by length, and within the strings of the same length, you make up some rule on the order in which they could occur, should occur. Um, interpret them as binary representations of integers would be an obvious way, but you know, and it doesn't matter. OK, so the finite binary strings are countable. And what we're going to prove now is that the infinite binary strings are not countable. So we use this notation, 0, 1 to the omega, meaning we're talking about infinite binary strings. Well, the way that we prove that this set of infinite binary strings is uncountable is by what's known as a diagonal argument, which goes back to Cantor's original ideas. Incidentally, I should mention that how did Cantor get into this? He was actually an analyst studying Fourier series, and uh, he had some results about Fourier series that showed that the series he was working with, uh, in fact, failed to converge at infinitely many points. But he wanted a way to say that it didn't matter. There weren't very many infinite. Uh, there weren't very many of these infinitely many points. And he needed some way to get a hold about how big an infinity was. Anyway, uh, back to a diagonal argument. The way we're going to think about the diagonal argument is let's suppose that I have a listing of infinite binary sequences. So. There's a zero of binary, infinite binary sequence, and a first, and a second, and so on. I'm wondering whether this list could include everything that's an infinite binary sequence. OK. Well, what I can do is create a matrix uh, that looks as follows. I'm going to write 
um, the infinite binary string S0, I'm going to make it the first row. So I've just written out its elements. It, its first el its zeroth element is 0, its uh, index 1 element is 1, its index 2 element is 1, its index 3 element is 0, and so on. It's a it goes infinitely to the right because it's an infinite binary sequence. I'm going to take binary uh, infinite binary sequence S1 and make it the second row, and so on. So that um, all of the infinite binary sequences in my list S0, S1, S2 occur as rows in this infinite matrix that's infinite to the right and infinite down. Now, what I can do is look at, um, I'm trying to build a sequence that's not here, okay? And this is the way I'm going to do it. Um, let's look to begin with at the diagonal elements. So. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing the back and forth because I'm a little bit confused here and getting ahead of myself. So um, the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to start my new sequence that I'm building that's not in this list by flipping the first bit of S0, the zeroth bit of S0, and making it a 1. And that means that if my sequence starts with a 1, it differs from S0. The second element of my sequence is going to be the flip of the next diagonal argument. It was 1, so I'm going to make it 0. That guarantees that my infinite binary sequence differs from the first row because it's different at the first place. I'm going to keep going like that. Okay? I'm going to complement the zeros and 1s along the diagonal and wind up with this infinite binary sequence defined by going down the diagonal of this matrix. So let's look at this sequence. What I figured out is that it differs from every row because it differs from the third row in the third position and the 15th row in the 15th position. And for every row, it differs somewhere. It's not in the list. And that means that uh, 0, 1 to the omega can't be listed in this way because anything that I list is going to be missing. Um, this diagonal sequence will be missing. And we can conclude then that the infinite binary sequences are uncountable. Because if you give me some list of them, I've shown you how to find something that's missing, namely the diagonal sequence. What this proves then is that that mapping, S0, S1, S2, and so on, which is a mapping from the non-negative integers to the sequence that is of indexed by that non-negative integer, cannot be a surjection. It doesn't hit all of the infinite binary sequences. And so what we've really shown is that it's not the case that there's a surjection from the non-negative integers onto the infinite binary sequences. Uh, it's also easy, if you think about it the other way, that it, there's a very obvious surjection from the infinite binary sequences onto the non-negative integers. There's lots of them. For example, I could map an infinite binary sequence uh, to the number of ones that it has, uh, if it has a finite number of ones. And if it has an infinite number of ones, I don't know, map it to zero. So that defines a, a, a total function on the infinite binary sequences that's clearly a surjection onto n, because every sequence with n ones maps to the number little n. So I get a surjection one way, which I'm thinking of as meaning that uh, that 0, 1 to the omega surge non-negative numbers means that the infinite binary sequences are greater than or equal to the number of natural numbers. Um, they're at least as big. And the other not neg negated assertion is really saying that um, it's not the case that uh, n is as big as 0, 1 to the omega. So we could really say that the natural numbers are strictly smaller than um, the set of infinite binary sequences. And I'm going to define A strict B to mean that there is no surjection from A to B. It's not the case that A is at least as big as B. Now, it's a technical theorem, as a matter of fact, that if it's not the case that A surge B, if it's not the case that A is greater than or equal to B, then um, as a matter of fact, there will be a surjection in the other direction. And in earlier versions, I used to make that part of the definition of strict. But since it's in implied, we're going to leave it out. So it makes it easier to check strict. You just have to check A strict B means there's not a surjection from A to B. Uh, and we're going to interpret this as meaning that A is strictly smaller than B. So now we can come to Cantor's theorem. Um, and it's very simple to state. It says that for any set A, 
A is strictly smaller than the power set of A. More precisely, um, there is no surjection from A to the power set of A. So A and power set of A are in this strict relation. It doesn't matter whether A is finite or not. Uh, I mean, check it. If A is empty, the power set of A has one element. And in general, if A is finite with n elements, the power set of A has 2 to the n elements. And 2 to the n is always bigger than n. So it works immediately for finite sets. And Cantor's observation by a very simple, elegant argument is that it works even for infinite sets A. So give me a set, its power set is bigger. That's how I can keep getting bigger ones. Um, how does the argument go? Well, it's, it's about thinking about a diagonal argument. What I'm going to do is suppose that, for, for the sake of contradiction, that I actually had a function that mapped A to the power set of A. Um, let's assume it's a total function that maps A to the power set of A. Um, and I'm trying to show that f can't be a surjection, because if it was a surjection, then f, then a and power set of a would be in the surge relation, and that's not true. So my objective here is to say, give me any function that maps a to the power set of a, I'm going to show you something that's missing. Now, the way I do that is that I think of um, the elements of a as though they were uh, labeling the, uh, the rows of a two-dimensional matrix like the one we saw that was labeled with the, the non-negative integers. And the columns, I can also think of as being labeled by uh, the elements of A. And I'll put a one under an, a, in, a, in, a, in an element in a row position, little a, little b in row a position b, if b is in that row. It, if b is in the set that corresponds to that row, if b is in f of little a. So in effect, the row uh, is a coding into zeros and ones of the set f of little a. If we think about it that way, then this argument that I'm about to show you, which doesn't draw any pictures, really is saying in words rather elegantly the reasoning that's behind the diagonal argument where we're thinking of them going down the diagonal of a matrix. So I'm going to define a subset of a that is not in the range of f by thinking about going down the diagonal. And what that means in this case is that I'm going to define the set D to be those row labels where the row label is not in the set represented by the row. So it's the set of A in little, in capital A, little a in capital A, such that little a is not in the set F of A. Remember, F of A here is supposed to be a set of elements in A. It's a member of the power set, which means it's a set of elements in little a, uh, in capital A. And either little a is in this subset or it's not. And if it's not, I'll put it in D. And if it is, I'll leave it out of D. That's the definition of D. Um, now, what we're going to see is that D can't be in the range of F because it differs from the set F of A at A. and it's the same argument that we did with differing from every row. But let's spell it out a little bit more, because it might be a little hard to follow in this sort of set theoretic way. So let's do it again carefully. Suppose that I have a function from the set A to the set power set of A. Um, then I'm going to define this set D as before. And the set D has the property by definition that an element A is in D if and only if A is not in the image of little a under f. It's not in the set f of a. And this is going to be the case for every a. This is the definition of d. a is in d if and only if a is not in f of a. Well, um, what I can do now is suppose to the contrary that d is in the range of f which I'm going to try to show as a contradiction. So suppose that d is in the range of f. What does that mean? That means that there's some little a, call it a sub d, which, um, and f of a sub d is the set d that we claim, that we think shouldn't be there. But we're going to suppose it is there, which means that, um, that f hits it, and let's say f of a sub d hits d. Well, what that means then is that, um, 
we said that A was in D if and only if A was not in F of A, but now D is F of A sub D. So I can rephrase what I know as A is in F of A sub D if and only if A is in F of A. And this holds for every element little a of capital A by the definition of the set D and the element A sub D that we've uh, said was the thing that hit the set D under F. Okay. Now we get an immediate contradiction out of this by letting little a be a sub d in this. If I do that, I immediately get that a sub d is in f of a sub d if and only if a sub d is not in f of a sub d. And I've got my contradiction. And we conclude that there can't be an f arrow uh, into the set d. Um, that d is the thing that's missing from the range of f. And that's why f is not a surjection. And that completes the proof because we've just shown that no function can be a surjection. Okay, so the power set of A is in the is strictly bigger than A. Um, what about showing that the uh, that the that the set of infinite binary sequences is uncountable? Well, we did it by a diagonal argument before, but there's another way to do it indirectly that's instructive, which is suppose that um, to the contrary. Uh, I had a bijection from uh, the uh, n to the infinite binary sequences. Okay, that's what we're claiming isn't there. The definition of uncountable means there isn't such a there isn't su such a bijection. So suppose there was, for the sake of contradiction, um, that uh, okay. Well, what we know is that there is a bijection between the infinite binary sequences and the power set of n. I uh, just have a row uh, where the ones indicate which elements, in which natural numbers are in the set and which are not in the set. So there's a direct correspondence that we've seen before um, where finite bit strings correspond to, uh, to the subsets of a, of a finite set. And it extends fine to an infinite set like the non-negative integers. So we know that there's a bijection from the infinite binary sequences uh, and to the power set of n. Well, if you compose these two bijections, what do you get? You get a bijection from the non-negative integers to the power set of n, and that contradicts Cantor's theorem. So this is another indirect way of showing how Cantor's theorem implies and captures all these diagonal arguments, that it implies that there's no uh, surjection from the, the non-negative integers to 0, 1 to the infinity, uh, and that Therefore, they're an uncountable number of infinite binary sequences.